Well, good morning. These are the hardy, hardy ones. Tell you, I always, I love, I love this event. I love the March for Life. Uh, to me, there's really nothing more inspirational than to see thousands and thousands of pro-lifers who know that there's about five to seven inches of snow about to be dumped on our heads. The federal government is closed. There was nobody on the roads today except pro-lifers coming to, uh, to band together and, and to think about where we're headed, what we've accomplished, and what's coming next. Do you know, um, so that's thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Janine mentioned Rolling Stone, and we've, we've kind of been laughing internally because the headlines talked about the stealth war against abortion. So here you are this morning. We're all being very stealthy um, as we <laughs> speak right into the microphone to tell you where we see this uh, battle going. Because really what I'd like to highlight this morning is some things that I think need to be very, very public about how we are addressing the abortion issue and where the pro-life movement is going. Do you know, uh, something that doesn't generally make my introductory uh, comments as, as people are introducing who I am is, is an, a part of my bio that was a brief period in my life, but one of, the, one of my favorite experiences is that after I served in the Reagan White House, um, I was trying to figure out where I was going to go next, so I spent some time in England at Oxford University working on ethics and philosophy. And as you know, in the English system, they, it's different than the way we do it here, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to spend some time there, is they believe in having a tutorial system where you interact with one-on-one -on -one with a professor, and he challenges you and, and questions you very intensely over a particular issue. And so in meeting with my tutor, the first thing that he asked me was, why was I pro-life? And he wanted to challenge me on that. And as I talked about why I was pro-life, he cut me off very dismissively. And he said, I want you to go write a paper on why a woman should have a right to choose. And I was a little dismayed and surprised that that's how he wanted to start our relationship. But I went off and I wrote a really, really dreadful paper, which he cut to shreds. And he made me go back and write it again. I think he made me write it again several times before he was satisfied that I had really, really explored my opponent's arguments on this issue. So that's part of what I want us to have as a subtext as we begin this day, is thinking about our arguments and thinking about where we are moving as a movement in talking about abortion and engaging with, the, engaging with our opponents who think so dramatically different than we do. Janine mentioned the New York Times looking at our strategy, and they spent, honestly, they spent at least six months talking to various members of our staff and delving into uh, going through reams and reams of AUL material. And one of my favorite moments from interacting with that reporter is she, she, I told her this story about Oxford, and she said, well, in that experience, she says, what did you come away thinking was their most cogent argument? What was the most the most difficult argument that you find to engage with on, on the uh, pro-choice side. I stopped and thought for a minute, and I have to honestly tell you that I think that their arguments are not good at all. They're not good at all. I have a hard time identifying one that I think has any intellectual consistency or integrity to it. And that is why you see such a continual dodge in engaging with those who are trying to advance the cause of abortion. They don't want to talk about what is actually going on in this arena, so they continue to come up with different ways of packaging and relaunching their argument. Perfect example. Um, sometimes people ask me about my social media presence, and, and I have to respond that I do have five children. So <laughs> you can find me on Twitter. And those of you who are law students here, I hope you'll go, uh, you'll tweet at me today, hashtag uh, team life, hashtag why we march. Um, you also want to follow Catherine Lopez, who is one of my favorite commentators on, on Twitter and pretty much anywhere else. Um, so recently I was you know, in a cab or something, and I was scrolling through my Twitter feed, and, and something caught my attention. And it was, um, it was an exchange from a young woman on the other side, and she made the comment, but the baby doesn't have a choice. 
Thanks, sir. I'd never heard that one. I renounce my activism. Hand me a pamphlet. So she was kind of mocking pro-lifers, and she was going through a whole litany of our arguments that she thought were dumb um, and that did not have a whole lot of um, credence to them. And it kind of made me mad. <laughs> I stopped and I thought, uh, never heard that one, huh? Well, my response to her was, well, I've never actually heard you respond to that. So we ended up getting in this back and forth. I didn't want to engage a whole lot. But it ended up that a woman that I do engage with sometimes on Twitter named Leah Torres, who is actually an abortionist out on the West Coast, kind of jumped into this whole thing. And she responded by saying that when someone cannot have a desired abortion, she is forced to carry the pregnancy and give birth, and that's offensive. This really captured my attention because I think it is really important for us to actively engage with the arguments that we're hearing from the other side, to try to figure out what is it exactly that they're thinking. How are they, how are they coming at this issue? And I was fascinated by this idea of forced birth forced birth. Because from our, expect, our perspective, the idea that somehow we would, we would look at this amazing beginning of a new life as something that is forced is, is really kind of awful. So my response to her, at some point I decided it, it was diminishing returns on, on Twitter, and I just responded, hashtag Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. And you can see what her response was. She says, I don't know what that means. I thought that was particularly interesting because for me, I thought I stopped and I thought, well, maybe, maybe I'm being a little too obscure with my reference here, but what was particularly interesting to me was my pro-life friends understood exactly what I meant. My pro-life friends ex understood exactly what I meant. And what I want us to think about this morning is the fact that we're at a really unique point in the debate on abortion, is that the abortion movement has become so entrenched in their Alice in Wonderland viewpoint of the world that we really are living in different realities. Their double speak on the reality of the unborn life has become so entrenched in their way of thinking that our entire culture has become shockingly calloused. Shockingly calloused. Why is that? Why, why, is she, why is she able to talk about forced birth and along the way uh, some other people came along and said that the answer to the fetus having choice is the fact that the woman's autonomy trumps the baby's life. The woman's autonomy trumps the baby's life. We've moved beyond, completely beyond the days of a euphemism about the baby. Think back, I'd say a decade, a decade and a half ago, where we were still talking about a clump of cells, um, different kinds of euphemisms that they would come up with to obscure the reality of the baby. But with the advent of the 4D sonogram, an increasing reality that is undeniable of the baby's life, They've moved beyond euphemism into a new era of hardness. As a culture today, we understand that it's a baby. We understand that it's a baby. It is undeniable in this culture that it's a baby. But now, they just don't care. They don't care. I need to speed up a little bit because we have a remarkable panel in front of us and um, Evangeline's job is to get out a hook and, and pull me off when I run over and we do have people who are going to cover some of the other topics that I'm going to very, very briefly, briefly introduce. So I'm going to go very quickly and introduce a few concepts that will, I hope, foreshadow what's going to come over the next two hours as we're together. And my main point that I want to segue into and in introducing to you is to, is to capture this idea of the undeniableness of the life of the unborn and this growing callous, growing um, hardness in our culture and this cultural development with the law. 
So frequently, people dichotomize culture and law. I'll hear people who say to me, you know, I don't want to be involved with the law because the culture is where it's really at. And what I want you to see today is that this idea of turning away from the baby, closing our eyes to the baby, is actually entrenched in our law. And there's something we really need to be paying attention to. I'm going to skip over this. Uh, because we do have uh, our attorney panel, I believe Clark will probably talk about the underpinnings of Roe, and even back in Roe, we saw the development of this juxtaposition of the two governmental interests in preserving the right to abortion are the woman's health and the life of the unborn baby. The government has an undeniable interest in these two elements. I'm going to skip over this and move forward. The point that I want, well, actually, no, I'm not. I'm going, to, I'm going to stay with this. I want you to see that as early as in Roe, we had the justices telling us that the government was interested in the woman. So they said in Roe that a state may properly assert important interests in safeguarding maternal health, in maintaining medical standards, and in protecting potential life. The privacy right involved, therefore, cannot be said to be absolute. The privacy right cannot be said to be absolute. The state has legitimate interest from the outset of the pregnancy in protecting the health of the woman. This is coming forward to 1992 in Planned Parenthood v. Casey. Now, there was, there was quite a bit that we accomplished in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, but it was a disappointment in that it did not overturn Roe. So it's important for us to pause on this and ask why. What did we learn from that decision? And what we learned is that the court was telling us that even though we were, they were going to preserve the right to abortion, that they were still interested in the health of the mother. So why did they not? Why did they not overturn Roe at that point? Why did we lose that argument? That's our key question. And the reason is this. Justice Kennedy told us that the court is concerned about the woman. They're concerned about the woman. And he said, for two decades of economic and social developments, people have organized intimate relationships and made choices that define their views of themselves and their place in society in reliance on the availability of contraception, or excuse me, of abortion in the event contraception should fail. I'm going to, if you'll stick with me, there's a couple more elements of this that are absolutely essential. He went on to say, the ability of women to participate equally in the economic and social life of the nation has been facilitated by their ability to control their reproductive lives. The Constitution serves human values, and while the effect of reliance on Roe cannot be exactly measured, neither can the certain cost of overruling Roe. The certain cost of overruling Roe. If you put yourself in the justice's seat, what they are concerned about, what they are hearing from the abortion lobby, is that if you overturn Roe, it will hurt women that women need abortion, and why? This is the point we must not miss. Why do women need abortion? They need abortion. We, we as women, need abortion for our place in society, to be strong, to be empowered. If you listen to them, this is what they talk about. This is why I started with talking about rhetorical dodges and how they're framing their arguments. We need to be paying attention. They are not talking about the baby. They can't talk about the baby because the baby is speaking for itself in every single sonogram that we post on YouTube, every single sonogram that goes around the world with a click of a button. Instead, they want us to pay attention to Wendy Davis in her pink running shoes. In her 12 hours, on the floor of the Texas legislator, t legislature, did she talk about abortion? Of course she didn't. She wanted to talk about the fact that she went to Harvard Law School. And supposedly, supposedly, abortion was an essential part of that. 
So our mission in this is to address this question of women's health. And this is why AUL believes that the new frontier in addressing Roe is to develop a mother-child strategy. Now, talking about this in the context of the March for Life is humbling because in developing this strategy, we stand side by side with the remarkable men and women who have the courage to hold signs that say, I regret my abortion, and to march up Capitol Hill and to stand in front of the Supreme Court and say, you lied to me. You lied to me. There is no truth in this lie that abortion is good for women that abortion is important to this culture. It's a lie. And we have brave men and women in this movement who refresh our enthusiasm, who undergird our commitment every day by being a part of the pro-life movement. We, as legal architects of the pro-life movement, want to link arms with those brave people and say there is a legal strategy that goes along with that cultural movement that is so strong. We need a mother-child strategy in our culture. We must not allow them to drive a wedge between the mother and her baby, between us and the important concerns that women have in our culture today. So undermining this reliance interest, this belief that the certain cost involved in overturning Roe is an undermining of a woman's position in our culture, is at the heart of the Women's Protection Project that we are talking about here today. I'm going to skip over this slide, although I want to introduce it, because we have Dr. Monique Chereau, who is with us today, who's going to talk about abortion's harm to women. We need to be getting these facts out there about how abortion harms women. The data is out there. There is a conspiracy of silence in the medical community to keep women from knowing how deeply abortion harms women. So the Women's Protection Project is targeted at the state's interest in safeguarding maternal health. The Supreme Court has told us that an important governmental interest is in safeguarding women's health. And so our entire project is designed around a mother-child strategy to really focus the Supreme Court on the fact that both the woman and the baby are harmed in abortion. Let us never forget that in addition to the harms to the women who survive abortion are women who are dying across this country from abortion. And yet, there are no marches from the abortion lobby. They're, they are so good at putting on marches, on putting on demonstrations, but where are the placards with Tanya Reeves' picture on it? Where are the placards with Holly Patterson's picture on it? Where are the placards with Jennifer Morbelli's picture on it? Where are the placards with Karnamaya Mongar's picture on it? Because it, this is a pro-life audience, I know that you know who these women are. Each and every one of them lost their life, not actually in an abortion clinic, no. No, they lost their lives in an emergency room. Because across this country today, women are going in for abortions and being told, if something goes wrong, go to the emergency room and don't tell them you had an abortion. How is that pro-woman? How is that defending women's health? It is not. Abortion is harming women across this country today, and there are women who are dying at the hands of abortionists, and they are not being held accountable. This is wrong. This is wrong and it must stop. As I thought about concluding these remarks with these women's faces, and I put this, put this together, I thought something really struck me about this. As you think about those faces that just went by, Tanya Reeves, a black single mother from the inner city of Chicago, Holly Patterson, a teenager, from California, Jennifer Morbelli, a young woman, newly married, school teacher from the Northeast in her late 20s, and Karnamaya Mongar, a mother of four who had survived refugee camps before coming to 
the great, to try to live the great American dream here in our country. So different, each one of those women, so different from so many different segments of our culture and our society. And the one thing, the one thing that unites them is abuse at the hands of an industry that claims to defend them. Let's remember their names today and tomorrow as we march. Thank you for being here today, for continuing a commitment of defending the most defenseless amongst us, the unborn in the womb who have no voice. Let us remember that their mothers too are abused by this industry. It's really my great honor to move from that and to introduce a colleague who I so appreciate the opportunity to work with, Clark Forsythe. Speaking of commitment and dedica dedication, Clark Forsythe inspires me as I get to work with him. He's coming up on, um, oh Clark, which it's your 29th. <laughs> I wanted to say 30th, okay, so we have to wait one more year to get you into uh, the 30th anniversary, but Clark has been uh, working with American Genetic for Life for 29 years, and, and what an amazing resource this is for us as an organization, but also for the movement to have his deep commitment of his uh, remarkable analysis, and he, as most of you know, I'm sure, he, in September, released a book called Abuse of Discretion, which looked at um, and revealed the construction of Roe v. Wade. It's so tempting for all of us to think that Roe v. Wade happened uh, through kind of a natural process in the hurly-burly of American politics, but it did not. There was a deliberate movement to construct the right to abortion, to create it. Um, and Clark, Clark has written a very dramatic and essential book for the pro-life movement. He's going to come join us and walk us through some of that this morning. Thank you again for being with us, and I hope you will stay with us for the next uh, few hours as we think about the new frontier of reversing Rome.